I am excited to have Tiffany and Merrick here tonight with us to share their passion for both art and science. So tonight's presentation is going to be unique where there'll be a little draw, you're invited to draw along as the pre presentation is going on. And so I am going to turn it over to Merrick and Merrick and Tiffany will both introduce themselves um, as well. So. Yeah, thank you, Leah, and it's, it's great to be here, and um, we've been looking forward to this for so long, so I'm glad we're finally able to meet up as we meet up nowadays. Um, so welcome, everybody, and, uh, and thanks to Swam Lakes Association. My name's Merrick. I am a cartoonist and a musician, um, and I draw lots of different comics, but tonight we're going to be drawing, uh, if you have a paper and a couple pieces, a couple pieces of paper and a pencil, um, you can draw along with me, and I'm going to put my, my desktop and my hands up on the screen as Tiffany presents some loons, um, and we'll be able to see from Tiffany's photos and from the, the style of cartooning we're going to do, we'll learn a lot about the loons. So if you want to take a minute to, just to make sure your pencil is sharpened, you might want an eraser, and any kind of paper will be fine. This is very um, accommodating, very accessible style of cartooning that we're going to do tonight. And over to you, Tiffany, who are hey, you? Thanks. <laughs> thanks so much, Merrick. And thank you to Leanne and the Squam Lake Association for having us. As Merrick said, we're really excited about this. So it's great to be doing this. Uh, my name is Tiffany Grady, and I'm the Squam Lakes biologist with the Loon Preservation Committee. And so um, as Merrick is being very creative and um, bringing the loons to you in art, I'll be telling you a little bit about the science and biology behind loons, um, as well as uh, the issue with lead fishing tackle. And so I'm really excited about it. So thank you all for joining us. Super. Yeah, and that's really um, what got me involved in this is the, the urgency about lead pollution and, and lead contamination and how they affect loons. So, um, so let's start with a simple loon. Uh, we decided maybe Tiffany has a lot to introduce us to about loons, um, but we thought maybe we could start just by making some marks on paper. So I'll put up one of Tiffany's loon photos here. And um, this, like I said, it's a very accessible style of cartooning. We're, we'll just use a pencil tonight and we're gonna just make some marks on paper that help us understand these creatures. So one of the things with cartooning, you can draw along as we do this, um, when I cartoon things, I'm very seldom trying to draw the actual thing, right? I'm not so much trying to draw this rippling water with all its shadows and light and all its beauty. I'm actually trying to make a simple single line that hopefully makes you think of water. Um, so let's start with that tonight. Um, and so we can start with a water line and then we'll put a loon in here. And to make a loon, the way I'm cartooning them, uh, we're just gonna use a few simple shapes. So what I wanna try here is a teardrop shape with a point on one end and round on the other end. The point is the tail and the round part is the front. And don't worry if it doesn't look like my teardrop shape here. It's, um, it, it'll be your own loon tune. Your loon tunes will look however they look and we'll just let them happen on the page. Um, so I draw my teardrops sort of floating low in the water and we'll hear why it's gonna, it's gonna sink kind of low in the water as it swims. You can see in that picture that loon doesn't float up on top of the water. It sinks down in and kind of rides just below the surface mostly. Um, and like I said, simple shapes here. Let's go up from that front a little ways, whatever feels about right to you. Um, based on this photo, we're gonna put the head on there and that head could be kind of close. I'm gonna actually bring it up a little higher just so I can see the head clearly. You don't have to get it exactly right. Let's give it a round circle. If you wanna be a little more realistic, you can kind of squish that circle. You can see how in the photo, the loon's head is a little long rather than a, a sphere, right? It's, it's a very different shape. But as a cartoonist, I'm trying to just make you think of a bird or a loon. Now, two choices. If you wanna do the simple neck, we're gonna use a straight line to drop from the back of the head down to the body, anywhere right around those shoulders, and a straight line from the middle of the head down to about the front of the body. I almost missed it there. If you want to get fancy, you can look in that photo and there's this beautiful curve to that loon's neck. It's like an S curve, right? So if you want to get fancy, you can try doing a letter S around, but I'm going to keep it super simple to start with. 
If I were going fancy, I might play around with S curves, see how those two S's kind of capture that loon's neck. And it, that's the loon can, uh, can raise its head up pretty high, extend it in front or below, really low. Let's keep it simple for now. All right, so we used a teardrop shape, circle, straight lines to make the neck. The other shape we'll use with the loons is a very pointy triangle off the front of that head. Let's see, let's not worry about the fish just yet, but the fish will be in that beak by the time this loon is done hunting for food. And if you wanna get fancy, I can see that beak kind of comes back into the head like that. And then we can erase the lines. But like I said, I'm not gonna get super fancy. I'm keeping it super simple here, just because I don't know how many of you have done loon tuning before. Remember your loon tune doesn't have to look like mine. And here's, here's a big trick with cartooning. I want my readers who, who see these um, cartoons to feel a connection with the animal. And I found if I give them like that, that bright red eye with the black spot like that, they look a little crazy on the page. So I give them a bigger eye spot and suddenly they look a little friendly, right? And it doesn't actually look quite like a loon's eye. An actual loon's eye is an amazing, amazing thing um, when you can see it up close, but this is a cartoon loon's eye. We might give it a little mouth. We're almost done here. These are the, just the basics of the loon. Way back on the back, we're gonna do a little leg that hurt the, the, the heel of the leg brings it forward. And let's do two of those. And Tiffany will tell us a lot about these legs. These are key. Um, and then on the end of that, I just put a little V on the end. Uh, you, can, you could do it on, off the end or you could do it up on the end. So the middle part of the leg becomes the toe. However, whatever makes sense to you as you draw them. And don't forget to web off those fingers there. That's, that's a super simple loon foot. And then, oh my goodness, these feathers are so beautiful. But let's keep it simple to start with. Let's give our loon a body line like that. This is, I, I've, I've tried all these different ways to cartoon these wonderful animals. And I keep coming back to keeping it as simple as possible. So all I'm gonna do for that back for now is I'll do lines across it like this and then check lines along it like this. <laughs> And it just kind of tricks your eye into seeing a checker pattern. Actually, those feathers make an incredible pattern that we could spend a whole hour program <laughs> trying to figure out how to draw with different materials. That at least, if it looks like it's, it could also be a plaid jacket this bird is wearing, but hopefully that'll look a little like a loon. I'm gonna add a little tail feather there. And Tiffany, if you have any suggestions, jump in. Just one more piece I'm gonna add is that band on the neck. And that's another beautiful marking, but my cartoon way of capturing that is just a little double line band and then those lines going across it. And then, you know, while we're listening, if you wanna come back and black in these areas, you can let yourself know that's gonna be blacked in. And then while we're, if we're done early with another picture, you can come back in and finish blacking this in and you can figure out how to black in the beak and so on. Did I miss anything, Tiffany? Is there any, that's, anything that's for our- absolutely fantastic, Mary. Okay. I love it. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm so impressed how you, um, how you put these amazing birds onto the page and, um, and do that. That's, that's really fantastic. Oh, thank you. Well, it, it's really fun to, to look at a picture. And then I usually recommend to people, look at the picture. And if you're cartooning, look away from the picture even, and try to capture what you remember from it, step by step, one piece at a time. Um, but that's a very, that's a very simple loon tune. And um, so now, now that we have, we've, we've kind of run our pencils around this creature and figured out how many legs it has, and these are the wings, by the way, tucked in here, and how many heads it has. Let's hear some more, even more specific than that, um, details of loon lore. So Tiffany, take it away. Great, and, thanks, Mary. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, sorry, by the way, I'm gonna keep drawing while you present, Tiffany, if that's Fabulous. all right. Fabulous, that's great. I will love watching watching these loons develop on the page as we're going along here. Great, so let's take a blank piece and you can draw along with me as we, 
as Tiffany presents. Okay. Great. So I love to, um, Merrick, I love to think about loons. Um, just they're such an aquatic species, you know, that really loons are most at home on the water and under the water, um, which is really pretty cool. Um, and so let, let's take a look at a loon underwater um, and we can see some of the things that make loons look, um, make loons so well adapted for life underwater. And of course, for a loon, being underwater is just so important because really the number one thing on a loon job description is catch fish and catch a lot of them. And, you know, if you're a bird, you need to go underwater to do that. So here we've got a picture up of a loon swimming underwater and just look how incredible they look under the water. And when you're looking at that picture, you can start to see some of the adaptations loons have for their life as an underwater predator. Um, really all of the loons adaptations are geared to helping them catch fish. They're very specialized um, in that regard. And so the first thing I wanna point out is look at where those legs are. Merrick's already talked a little bit about the loon's legs, um, but that positioning is actually pretty unusual. So when a lot of people first encounter loons, they think, oh, they must be kind of like a duck, right? They've got the webbed feet, they're on the water. Um, but think about where a duck's legs are. A duck's legs are like maybe a quarter forward from their tail. But look where the loon's legs are way back there, uh, right by the tail, just like Merrick has just drawn uh, there um, on his picture there. And of course, the other thing to look notice about the loons, and it's a little bit hard to see on the picture, but you can see it on the, on the loon's left leg a little bit. They have these huge oversized feet. They're much larger in relation to their body size than a duck's foot is. And I love it, Merrick. That's fantastic. <laughs> it looks great. And what this does for the loons um, is it gives them a huge surface area. Um, and so as you can see from the photograph there, um, the loons are just using their feet underwater. The wings are pressed against the body um, and they're just using their feet and pushing along through the water. And by having that huge surface area, you know, that those feet catch a lot of water as they're pushing along. And the important thing about having their legs so far back on their body, it's basically like us putting the motor on the back of our boat. This is where the power is. You know, we don't put our motors, you know, a quarter forward from the end of our boat. We put them at the back of the boat. And the loon is, um, this makes the loon a very powerful swimmer underneath the water. Um, so it's really pretty cool. And so I mentioned that loons and ducks are not closely related. Your trivia for the night is closest living relatives of loons are actually penguins and albatross. And so you can sort of see that in the shape of the bird there. And also think about the foot position. Think about where a penguin's feet are. Loons are in the same, loons feet are in the same place. Of course, they move differently underwater. Penguins use their wings, loons don't, but it's that same structure there. And the wings are actually really important as well. Loon's wings are actually an adaptation for life underwater. Crazily enough, you know, you think of most birds, wings flying in the air, and obviously loons do that. Um, but loons have very small wings in relation to their body size. And this is yet another adaptation for life underwater. If they had larger wings, they'd bulk up on their back more and create drag, slow them down underwater. But look at that picture and Merrick's capturing it in his drawing as well. Those wings are very flat uh, against the body. Um, and by having these small wings, it just lets that water uh, just flow over their back and makes them very streamlined. And speaking of streamlined, just look at that whole shape. Look at how they're holding their head underwater. Um, you know, they're just, they're so, I like to say aerodynamic, but of course they're not in the air. There's my, I guess maybe the word is hydrodynamic or something, but they are, they're just, they're so streamlined underwater. The water just flows over them. And um, this is what makes them so good um, at swimming um, underneath the water. And of course, the thing that you can't see on this picture, um, but it is another adaptation and it goes to what Merrick was saying before about loons sitting low in the water. Uh, loons have very dense bones. Of course, most birds adapted for flight, you wanna be as light as possible. 
They have hollow bones with just little struts supporting that bone structure. Loons in contrast have very dense bones. And what this does for the loons is it reduces the amount of air inside of their body. Um, and of course, air is what makes you buoyant and helps you float. So this is how life preservers work. They trap air. But by reducing the amount of air underwater, or excuse me, reducing the amount of air in their body, uh, they're reducing their buoyancy, helping them to stay underwater as well. So loons are, you could, you know, loons are just underwater machines. Um, and if you're a little fish that's, you know, a few feet ahead of that loon, well, you know, it's time to start saying your goodbyes because uh, that loon will definitely um, be having you for lunch. <laughs> I love it, Merrick. <laughs> That's fantastic. This is, what, this is what I love about cartooning. You you can't do quite that the same sort of uh, characterization in photography or other art forms. But if you're cartooning, you can quickly add in a little comment or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yum. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. That's fantastic. I love it. Um, so speaking of yum, let's talk about, you know, what loons, what are the favorite fish of loon? What, what really makes a loon go yum? Um, other than pretty much any fish, but they certainly do have their favorites. Um, and their favorites are really based on what is um, easiest for them to catch. Um, and so the loons really like uh, the warm water fish. And actually, Merrick, if we can flip back to the previous slide, the slide that we had there for a second with the, um, the fish on it, you'll notice what that loon has there. It's a sunfish. Mm -hmm. And sunfish are warm water fish. And the loons really like the warm water fish. Um, so sunfish, perch, bass, um, bullheads, things like that. And the reason the loons really go for these warm water fish um, is because when a warm water fish is escaping from a predator like a loon, they tend to just sort of zigzag through the water. Of course, loons are very maneuverable underwater. It's very easy for them to get fish like that. Now they will take the trout and the salmon, the cold water fish, but they tend to take those more opportunistically. Um, and the, the cold water fish have a different strategy to escape a predator. They basically dive straight down to go to the deep part of the lake. Of course, loons are great divers, but going straight down like that, not so easy for them. So they certainly will catch one if they can. Um, but it's just easier for a loon uh, to get one of those warm water fish. Typical prey size for loons is between four to eight inches, but loons will regularly ingest fish that are 12 inches uh, or larger. Um, and there we go, nice, <laughs> yep. Um, they regularly ingest fish that are 12 inches or larger. And in fact, the largest fish that's been documented in the scientific literature being eaten by a loon is nearly 17 inches, which just gives me a stomach ache just thinking about it because these loons are swallowing their fish whole. Um, the smaller fish, they tend to eat underwater. Um, the big fish they'll bring to the surface and um, uh, basically beat them into submission for a little bit before um, maneuvering them. Um, they'll come up crossways exactly like Merrick has shown there, but the loons will eventually manipulate that fish till it goes down head first. But of course, loon chicks have to eat too, right? And loon chicks are certainly not eating those 12 plus inch fish. And so Merrick, if you want to flip the slide ahead just a little bit there. Um, oh, the chick, yes. The chick picture, yes, there we go. So look at that little minnow. Um, this is what these little chicks are eating. Um, so loons, unlike um, so many birds, you know, of course a lot of birds regurgitate food for their young, um, but loons don't do that. Um, each food item requires a dive by the parents, bring up a little minnow, maybe bring up a crayfish, um, and hand it to the chick, repeat the process. Um, you see the loon is bringing that minnow to the chick crossways, um, but already, already on day one, they're doing this and teaching the chicks that, hey, you've got to turn that fish around so that it goes down, head, <clears throat> excuse me, head first. Um, I've seen loons bring crayfish um, to their chicks and it's gotta be the chicks first crayfish because the chicks look absolutely, absolutely horrified. They're just like, you're kidding me. You really want me to eat this? <laughs> um, but eventually eventually, the chicks decide, okay, this, this isn't so bad, but you know, minnows are definitely 
um, are definitely the main food source. And of course, oh, that's that's adorable, Merrick. I love it. <laughs> and of course, the uh, the minnows do grow, um, get bigger. The parents are catching bigger minnows for the chicks as those chicks grow. But when those chicks are really young, as you see on that picture and on Merrick's picture, and they're riding on the parents' back, they're getting just real tiny little minnows. That's fabulous, Merrick. That's a fantastic drawing. The chick is adorable. <laughs> oh, thank you. As loon chicks tend to be, not that I'm biased or anything, but. <laughs> They're so incredibly vulnerable. Just those tiny little critters that are out there on the lake. Yeah, exactly. Just... And this is one of the reasons the chicks back ride. Um, one, of course, loon chicks can swim right away. They do start working on diving already on day one. Um, but they back ride for the first two weeks uh, for exactly the reason you mentioned, um, because snapping turtles, as well as large fish like pickerel or large bass, could come up underneath and grab those little chicks. And it's a lot safer to be up on the parent's back. And both of the parents share the chick rearing duties equally. Um, so it could be either mom or dad that's uh, toting those little chicks around and protecting them from the snappers uh, that might want to try to get them. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Those, those tiny little chicks are so vulnerable. Um, but I tell you, loon parents do an awful good job. <laughs> but it's a, it's a tough world out there for them. Fabulous, some nice little, nice little weeds there. You gotta get place to, some place to hide. Uh, yeah, exactly, a perfect place. Those weed beds have a lot of minnows in them. And you know, loon, loons will actually, loons actually have nursery areas. Uh, that they take the chicks to um, that um, are protected from wind and waves and have a lot of food sources. So a nice little, nice little cove there um, with some nice weeds in there will provide great habitat for minnows um, and provide a nice protected little place for them to, to raise those chicks. All summer long and all sorts of weather. I love, I love drawing the, the loons and the different animals. And it just, you see so much diversity when you really start, you realize no, loons are never just out there on the lake alone. They're like surrounded by all these animals. And I love exactly. cartooning that into the picture. Exactly. They are as part of such a dynamic ecosystem. And um, they're, they share the lake with so many other creatures. And of course, you know, everybody else is affected by the same things that impact the loons. Um, and so it's really, you know, as we, as we're working to protect loons, we're working to protect every other species that lives in and uses the lake as well. Hmm. So speaking of that, um, we were, I, you mentioned how they eat uh, fish. And one of my favorite ways to draw loons is when they're swallowing some enormous 12 inch fish. It's just so <laughs> unbelievable that they do that. But that, so maybe that's what we'll do next. If we take a Great. blank page, um, I'll take a blank page here. If I have blank, there it is. And, but that is also that superpower that they have is also really their weak spot, isn't it? It is, it is exactly. Um, because of course that ability to catch these big fish is how they end up getting the lead fishing tackle, um, which is really, really sad that, you know, the thing that sustains these loons is also the thing that can kill them, um, which is just such a shame. So yeah, that picture right there um, and those 12 plus inch fish, this is how the evidence suggests that loons are getting this lead fishing tackle. Um, the data suggests that loons are getting it from current fishing activity. So, you know, think about a 12 plus inch fish is very capable of breaking a fishing line. And of course the fish that has tackle inside of it, it's, you know, it's broken a line, swallowed some tackle. Um, it might have fishing line coming out of its mouth. That fish is not swimming as well as that fish next to it. And that's the fish the loons are going to zero in on. Um, it's easy pickings for them. Um, and of course, as we talked about, loons do swallow their fish whole. Um, so if they're swallowing that fish that has tackle inside of that, the fish, they're going to end up getting um, that, that lead fishing tackle. Um, loons will also strike at baits that are being reeled in by an angler because the loon's instinct, you know, Loon's evolutionary history has taught them that if something flashes past them, 
um, in the water, it's a fish. And so they'll try grabbing at it. It could well be an angler's bait that might be led. Um, and loons will even strike at fish that are being reeled in by anglers because those fish are kind of flailing around. And so the loons think, oh, got to be something wrong with this fish. And it's, you know, it's injured or something. It's easy for me to catch. And if they end up breaking that line, they get the tackle. Um, we used to think that, uh, it used to be thought that loons got most of the lead that they ingest just from picking it off the bottom um, because loons will regularly ingest little pebbles as grit. It sits in their stomach and helps them grind up those fish that they're swallowing whole. Um, and that's what used to be thought happens, um, that loons are just simply picking up these split shots or small pieces of lead tackle that were dropped, you know, over the side of a boat, um, lost on the lake bottom. Um, but that seems to, that seems to be only a very minor way uh, that the loons get the lead. It, it happens, but it's a relatively small proportion of our uh, our data set. Um, and most of the evidence suggests they're getting it from these big fish um, that have broken the line. And this is actually really good news um, because it suggests that if people will make the switch over to uh, non-lead tackle, we'll see an immediate benefit to our loon population. We're basically not condemned to decades and decades of loons dying of lead poisoning from all this lost tackle on the bottom of the lake. Um, it suggests that if we make that change now, we will see an immediate benefit to our loon population. So this is a really, really important and positive uh, finding. Uh, so let's flip ahead to our next. <laughs> there we go. Very cute. <laughs> I was just gonna. I was just gonna put a say. This is a hooked fish, so maybe hook. Oh, it, there we hook go. Tonight. Yeah. And then just to make sure we've got that piece, like I'm gonna add a, a lead weight. Or maybe it's not lead, I, I don't know yet, but I'm gonna add a sinker to that hook or maybe a jig um, and then just kind of doodle the line coming out and squiggling around and trailing behind. Perfect, exactly, exactly. And then maybe that's over exactly here. how it happens, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's a huge fish that's broken a line. So maybe over in the distance here, I'll put a little fisher bean person <laughs> with the fishing <laughs> pole and a broken line going down in. We'll put a reel on there. And they're a little worried now because they're thinking, oh no, what, oh, I should have checked my lead gear. I should have checked my gear to make sure. Yeah. Might even, might even add a little line coming out of this fish. Perfect. Yeah, so, so that, when I've got to practice how they tip up like that as they're swallowing the weight of the fish, <laughs> tipping the loon forward. That's so amazing. Oh, yeah. So you had an actual x-ray of a loon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this, this x-ray shows the, um, all that tackle inside of a loon. And then the photograph next to it is showing what was removed from the loon after the, uh, so, you know, when these loons unfortunately die and we collect them, we send them for an animal autopsy, which is known as a necropsy. And the person doing the necropsy will, um, you know, open up that stomach. And this is all of the, all of the gear that came out of that loon's stomach. And so as you can see there, loons are literally swallowing the hook, line and sinker as the old phrase goes. Um, and this is one of the lines of evidence that, um, that, does point us in the direction that loons are not just picking this up off the bottom. Um, you know, if a loon was just picking up a little pebble, if you had, you know, a hook with fishing line on it and a leader and a swivel and the jig and the sinkers there, you know, no self-respecting loon is going to be like, oh yeah, this is a pebble and just keep eating it. Um, this is one of the lines of evidence that we have that suggests that these loons are, are getting this from current fishing activity. And yeah, there, there it is exactly in Merrick's picture. The fish down there with the hook in its mouth and the sinkers and the leaders and the hooks all down there. Um, I'm going full x-ray with this one. Exactly, exactly. Yes, this poor loon, yes. Um, but that's, ex uh, you know, that's exactly what these x-rays look like. And this is, you know, this is not what we want to see. If we, if we pick up a loon that's... Um, not doing well. And the first thing we do is we take it to the vet and get an x-ray. And uh, this is not what we want to see. So once the loons have ingested um, 
a lead object, whether it's a sinker or a jig. Um, you know, as you see, they go down to the gizzard, um, as the x-ray shows and as Merrick's drawing shows. And little gizzards are really powerful muscular organs. You know, they need to be able to grind up a whole fish. Um, and they have a very strong acid in there to help them do that. And so the grinding action of that gizzard combines with the acid that causes the lead to erode. And it goes into the loon's bloodstream and it goes into their brain, unfortunately. Um, and uh, a loon will die within two to four weeks of ingesting a piece of lead tackle. And there's pretty much nothing we can do about it because by the time we get the call that there's a loon on the beach or acting strangely, that lead is already inside of their brain. Um, and the loon is experiencing um, you know, loss of muscle control. They are having neurological issues. Uh, they may have convulsions. Um, and actually the lead will actually shut down their digestive system. Um, and so this is a really, really terrible way for a loon or any animal um, to go. Um, and yeah, so those, um, you know, by the time we get that call, these loons are already very sick. The only, the only, there's only been a handful of times that we've been able to treat a loon for lead poisoning. Um, and that's when, you know, you get that loon before it has toxic levels of lead. So once we take that loon to the vet, if an x-ray looks like what's on the picture there, um, we'll then give the loon a blood test. And if that blood test shows toxic levels of lead as it almost invariably does, we have no choice but to euthanize uh, that loon. Um, and as I say, it's a really, it's a really terrible way for these, uh, for these wonderful birds to die. And yeah, there's the lead going through the loon system um, as Merrick's showing there. It's the same with people too, as we as we learn exactly. more and more about lead, it, it goes from your digestive system right into your blood. If you're young enough as a person, it can get into your brain, loons, it can get into your brain and it's debilitating, even tiny little flecks, tiny it, amounts of them. Exactly, yep, the smallest lead split shots will kill a loon in two to four weeks. Um, it does not take much, um, unfortunately. Oh my gosh, this is now a very grim picture here. <laughs> so let's go on to the next slide there. Um, part of the research that Loon Preservation Committee does is, you know, as I've suggested, we do, we do collect the dead loons. And, you know, it's a really, it's a really sad part of the job. It's heartbreaking um, to pick up these loons, but it's so important to understand what is killing these loons and what's um, you know, because obviously we learn what, what we can do to help the loons by finding out what's killing them. And over the years, we've, you see there that over 40% of the adult loons that we collect have died as a result of ingesting lead fishing tackle. And then you also see an additional 4% there, lead unknown objects. These are very likely lead fishing tackle deaths as well. It's just that um, the object was so badly eroded inside of the loon that we could not identify it clearly as lead fishing tackle, but it very likely was um, also. Um, and so this is, this is a, you know, as you see this lead, the issue of lead is dwarfing. It's by far the largest cause of death in the adult loons. And once again, lead does target the adults because you know, they're the ones that are eating these 12 plus inch fish. We saw those little minnows that the chicks are eating. Um, this is something that targets the adult loons. But it, but I'm, I'm as I draw more and more chicks here since nesting season is uh, <laughs> wrapping up. Um, I'm very aware those those chicks are totally dependent on the adult. They are. Parents. They are. And if and they lose the if they too. lose one of their parents to lead poisoning, you know we have had a, we have had cases of loons successfully raising chicks after they lost their mate, but it's very difficult for the loons. Mm -hmm. And those chicks are in a much more, much more dangerous position. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's unfortunately a lot of those chicks that lose their, one of their parents to lead poisoning, unfortunately do not, do not end up making it either. Um, so it's a, it's a double hit here. You know, we're losing the adults and we're also losing the chicks. And that pie chart just seeing that is literally almost half of all those loon deaths is due to this this one um, this one source, right? This exactly, and the, 
Yeah, and it's such an avoidable cause of death. You know, this is a completely preventable cause of death for loons. You know, all those loons do not have to be dying um, of lead poisoning. Um, it's, uh, it's completely avoidable. It's completely preventable. We just need people to, you know, make sure that they're, the tackle they're using is, is safe um, and not the lead, lead tackle. Okay, so we were going to, you were also um, going to mention, I think, why we were going to draw like a big lake scene. We had four things planned here, right? We had, we had our loon intro picture, which we souped up and added a lot to. We had our uh, diving loon, our hydrodynamic diving loon and the <laughs> goodbye fish. Um, we have that, that grim image of how that works, that that big fish has pulled that. And just of all the fish the loon eats all summer long, uh, only one fish needs to have that sinker. Exactly. Into yeah. Death. You know, loons and loon families will eat so many fish in the course of the summer. It takes just one fish that's broken that line and that has tackle inside of it to kill one of those loons. Yeah. So we were going to make our fourth picture, um, our, our fourth and, and last picture of the evening. Uh, be a larger lake scene. Um, and you were going to tell us a little, I think, about uh, about like the larger systemic effects of lead population or, or why it's so important to loons, why they're sort of the, the indicator species or, or a central species in this story. Yeah, exactly. And so I, there's kind of two aspects of this I want to talk about. One is, as you say, the loons, the sort of the larger population um, loon issue here, and then also the, the ecosystem uh, issues. And um, the thing about loons is that as a species, you know, loons are really susceptible to things that impact adult survival. If you want to keep your loon population going, the key thing is to keep those adults alive. And as we said, lead does target the adults. Um, you know, obviously, we don't want to lose chicks. It hurts the population and we just don't want to lose them. But from a population standpoint, losing the adult is so much worse because they're what drives the growth of the population. And the reason for that uh, is loon life history characteristics. Um, and so one of these is loons are really long lived birds. We really, we don't actually know how long loons can live, but right now our best knowledge suggests at least 25 to 30 years, which is really incredible. Loons are an amazingly long-lived bird. The thing is, is we've only been putting the color bands on the loon's legs and be able to follow these individual loons. We've only been doing that for about the last 30 years. So as we get out from the 30-year mark, we may find that loons live even longer than we think they do. Um, and in fact, right now, the oldest banded loon in New Hampshire is a female. She's at <coughs> Lake Ambagog. And she's at least in her early 30s, still going strong. Um, so it'll be fascinating as we get out from that 30 year mark to just find out how long loons really do live. Uh, and the second thing is, so because loons are such a long lived species, they have this very protracted life history. So it kind of goes back to what we we're talking about earlier that loon, a loon is something very different from a duck. Um, and, you know, ducks kind of live fast, die young. Loons have a totally different life history strategy. They live a long time, things are drawn out. And loons actually don't mature until they're three years old. Um, and then even once they are a mature adult, um, our banding data has suggested that they don't start nesting until they're at least six to seven years old. Um, we've even followed some loons that don't start nesting for the first time until they're 11 years old. So it takes a lot to get a loon from an egg to a nesting breeding adult. And once you have them there, you need to keep them there. Um, and finally, once they do start nesting, uh, loons have this very low productivity rate. On average, a pair of loons has only one chick that fledges or survives every two years. So once again, very different from the ducks. You see the ducks out there with their you know, 12 ducklings or whatever it is. Um, Somebody even showed me a picture of a merganser, which is a type of duck um, from Squam this year that had 
a whole collection of 35 little baby mergansers that it had uh, collected from probably multiple families combined there. Um, but you know, loons don't do that. Um, as opposed to the dozen ducklings or the dozen merganser chicks that you typically see, um, you know, loons will lay usually a maximum of two eggs. On rare occasions, they might lay three, but that's, that's very rare. Two is the normal. And then on average, um, they only have one surviving chick every two years. So you combine all of these things. And this is why lead impacts loons so badly. Um, you know, you need to keep those adults alive to keep your population going. They need to live a long life to be able to have multiple, um, uh, multiple opportunities to nest and try to successfully raise chicks. And um, when you have something like lead, where we're losing so many of the adults to it, and it's, um, it, really, it really impacts that loon population. Um, I always say lead is like the literal weight that's holding down the recovery of loons in New Hampshire. As we work to recover New Hampshire's loons, lead has, lead has really um, held back that recovery. We've actually done some estimates where we estimate that if all the loons um, that have died of lead over the years that uh, we've been studying this, um, had actually survived and gone on to live a normal life, have the chicks they would have, our loon population in New Hampshire could be 43% higher um, is what we're estimating. So lead has really, lead has really hit, the, hit our loon recovery. There's a lot of lakes out there that in New Hampshire that should be echoing to the calls of the loons and they aren't yet. And lead has certainly um, had an impact in um, keeping those lakes empty at this point. That's Tiffany, okay. Tiffany there's, a good, there's a good question in the chat that um, someone's asking, can loon survive eating lead-free tackle? So wondering if, if the lead-free tackle would pass through their system and if the loon could survive. Yes, that's a great question. And let's actually hold that thought for one moment. Uh, we, will, um, we will talk about that in just a few minutes, but that's a wonderful question. The short answer is yes. Um, and I will get into that um, a little bit more in just, in just a minute. Um, and so actually Merrick, if you could flip to, flip to our next slide. Uh, that's a lovely picture, Merrick. I love the loons with their little chick there and the merganser family um, along there in the back with all those little merganser chicks. That's fabulous. Ran out of room for the 35. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's easy to run out of room if you've got 35 behind you. <laughs> um, so this next slide just shows that, you know, it's not just loons. Um, as with so much else, loons are the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are so many other bird species that have been documented uh, to have ingested lead fishing tackle and to have died as a result. And you see a lot of, lot of the Squam Lake locals um, on that list as well. Bald eagles, great blue herons, common mergansers, mallards, cormorants, um, Canada geese, um, laughing, or excuse me, um, oh, I see ring-billed gulls is not on there, but we have other gull species. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, as with so many other things, loons are such an important indicator of the health of the aquatic environment and what affects the loons affects everything else that lives in and uses the ecosystem. And of course, it's not just birds, actually snapping turtles as well as painted turtles um, have been shown to, um, have been documented to ingest lead um, and bring it close to home for the people as well. Humans have been impacted um, by lead, um, dogs, um, hate to think of our, our dog friends ingesting lead fishing tackle, but it has happened. And of course, um, with people, it's very often children who, you know, might reach into a tackle box and pop some of those split shots uh, into their mouth. And um, it's just, you know, lead isn't safe. Lead isn't safe for anyone, um, basically. It's not safe for us. It's not safe for um, our pets, it's not safe for loons um, and other wildlife. Well, that's wonderful. There's a nice family out there fishing and hopefully using non-lead tackle. <laughs> there we go, check mark, yes. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what everybody can do um, 
to make sure that, you know, that our wildlife, our families, um, whether it's our four leg families or our two leg families stay safe. Um, and so New Hampshire um, was actually the first state in the nation uh, to implement laws against uh, restricting the sale and use of lead fishing tackle. Um, and Loon Preservation Committee has um, um, brought our data to bear in these discussions in the legislature, you know, documenting the loon mortality in the state. And right now we have the toughest laws in the country. Um, as you see up on the screen there, jigs and sinkers that weigh one ounce or less are um, banned for both sale in the state as well as use on freshwater lakes. And this is a very protective standard. Uh, this covers most, not everything, but most of what we see um, inside of the loons. So lead laws, check. Um, and let's, let's move on to the issue of non-lead fishing tackle. Obviously, you know, we want people to follow the law, but we also want people to do the right thing, which is um, using uh, uh, lead-free tackle. And if we can flip to the next slide there, uh, just a second. Um, there's so many non-toxic alternatives out there. You know, it doesn't take lead to sink a line. This is not rocket science. So tin, bismuth, steel, tungsten, stone, these are all out there. They're effective, they're affordable. And to get to the question we asked that the person asked earlier, yes, if a loon ingests these, they will be just fine. These are not toxic substances. Um, and we often get the question from people, well, you know, what about the hooks? How do you know it's the lead and not the hook? And the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, loons are in use to ingesting pointy, spiny, spiky things. Um, so think of the fish that they're eating, lots of bones in there. And if you have something like a perch, for example, um, you know, if any of you know perch, you know, they have a very spiny dorsal fin. Um, and so loons are used to dealing with sharp pointy objects and they've actually evolved a, um, a thicker wall in their esophagus as well as very thick wall in their gizzard. And so what we see um, is that the loon, you know, usually the hook is just floating around in their stomach, it's just fine. Sometimes it may embed in the wall of the esophagus or the gizzard, but if it does that, they just basically abscess that over. And if they basically just swirl that little hook away and it just stays embedded there and causes no further problems. On very, very rare occasions, you may have a hook or a fish spine that punctures the esophagus or the gizzard and the loon may develop an infection um, and die from that, but that's that's very rare. It's very rare. We've only documented nine cases of that um, in the years that since 1989 that we've been studying uh, loon mortality versus the you know over 160 cases of lead poison loons. So it's extremely rare. And these other these other types of uh, tackle, as I mentioned, these are non-toxic, and so the loon will just eventually pass that object and no harm done. Um, and these are all effective in catching fish. In fact, a lot of the people on the pro angling circuits are using tungsten um, because they catch more fish with tungsten. Tungsten is denser than lead. Um, and as a result, they can feel the action of that bait more in the water if they're able to catch more fish. Um, so if we go on to our next slide, you know, we are really trying to make sure people know to use use lead-free gear and know what the laws are in New Hampshire, that lead tackle um, is illegal for fresh water with the sizes I mentioned. And we're trying to get the word out. Um, you know, those old tackle boxes in the back garage and the back boathouse, those are gonna be full of lead. And we're trying to encourage people um, to get rid of that lead. And so we've started a lead tackle buyback program where um, Particip people in part um, participating tackle shops, they can bring at least an ounce or more of the illegal lead tackle in and we'll give them a $10 voucher to buy whatever they want. Um, hopefully some non-lead tackle, but whatever they need at the moment um, at that participating tackle shop. Um, on Squam, Squam Boat Livery uh, is our um, participating tackle shop, um, but you can um, find a list of all the tackle shops um, that are particip participating in New Hampshire at 
the loonsafe.org website, um, and uh, we'll show that in just a little bit. But you can also, you know, if you don't, if you don't feel you need that ten dollar voucher, you can bring in your lead tackle to the Squam Lakes Association. They're a, a lead tackle collection point, or the Loon Center. Um, we're of course a collection point as well. Um, although actually we do we do give out the vouchers also now that I think about it. Squam Lakes Association um, is a drop off point, and we'll dispose of that lead safely. Um, and we're just trying to get the word out and um, you know get that lead out of the system. Um, we've had our lead tackle buyback program for three years now. We've collected over twenty five thousand pieces of lead, um, any one of which. Could have killed a loon. Of course, that's just a drop in the bucket as far as what's out there, but it's a start. And we certainly encourage everyone to bring in their non-lead tackle to the SLA or to Squam Boat Livery or the Loon Center or wherever you might be, um, and we'll dispose of it safely and um, make sure that lead is no longer in the system. And the, um, the last thing that I just want to emphasize that we can all do to help the loons uh, is to reel in around the loons, you know? So I mentioned that the loons instinct is, you know, to strike at something that flashes past them and uh, cause they think it's a fish, but it might well be a bait. And, you know, even if you're using non-lead tackle we wouldn't want the loon to get tangled up in that fishing line. Um, if you are using lead tackle, heaven forbid that could be a death sentence right there for that loon. Um, but you know, if you're out there fishing and um, you know, there's a loon in the area, just reel in that line and just wait a few minutes and let that loon go on its way so that there's no risk that the loon swimming underwater, looking for fish, might, mistaking, might mistake your, um, your bait uh, for a fish and, you know, either end up with lead poisoning or get tangled up in fishing line, um, which can be very problematic for them um, as well. So, um, I love it. We're using lead-free, lead-free fishing tackle there, and our people in our boat have their lines in while the while the loons are in that area. That's absolutely perfect, Merrick. I love it. And you know, the fact is, is that this is the scene that we want. You know, the the loons with their chicks out there raising their families, you know, catching catching fish that aren't going to do them any harm, um, and just living living the life in that with that beautiful scene that Merrick's shown there. Um, the loons with their chicks, the, the turtles, the fish, uh, the mergansers, everybody's safe, um, the beautiful mountains, all the other birds, people out there fishing and enjoying their fishing um, in a responsible way. That's absolutely perfect. I love it. Mm. Tiffany, you. there's a question that someone has about if there's a way that folks can follow the loon population on Squam, so like the population numbers here on the lake. Yes, that's a great question. Absolutely. So um, send me an email. Um, I do regular newsletters during the summer in which I update people with what's happening uh, with the Squam loon population. Um, my email address is just squam at loon.org. Um, squam at loon.org, or you can um, go on to the Loon Preservation Committee website, loon.org, and just send an email to the info, the general info thing, and they'll get it to me. But my email address. Whoops. Tiffany, I don't know, you froze for me, so I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yeah, we can hear you, Merrick. Tiffany okay. is frozen at the okay. moment. Um, so, then I, oh, go ahead, oh, Leah. Yeah, I was just gonna say we could um, open it up for questions if folks have questions for Merrick. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he would be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any questions about cartooning or if you wanna also just talk about your other work, Merrick. Sure, I was. I think Tiffany was going to say um, the the other place you can find out more about loons is loon.org, and I used loon.org a lot last year when I was drawing my first Loon Tune um, mini comics because they have all this information about loons, um, and I use this as the start of my research. They have, as you can see, wonderful photographs by a number of contributing photographers. 
Um, and it's Loon Preservation Committee, so they're constantly updating uh, their loon cams when that's in season. And they also have a lot of education programs. Um, this, was, this was amazing uh, to me to discover last year that you could go on the loon cam when they're in operation and there's the loon on its nest live. <laughs> and um, and you can see, you'll see things happen. You'll see real wildlife scenes happen. So be ready for some excitement. Be ready for long hours of beautiful footage of loons sitting and watching and nesting. Um, but that's a wonderful source of information too. And we also wanted to flash up there loonsafe.org, which is Loon Preservation Committee's lead poisoning reduction initiative. That's the place to get all the information about um, the loon buyback programs. Um, and right here, they, they've got a lot of information here, but under buyback and disposal locations, you can find um, participating retailers and a whole bunch of resources that you can use. Um, and also a list of retailers who really specialize in and provide lead-free tackle. And we want to support them because like I told Tiffany, when I started researching this stuff, I was just kind of curious and I went online to an unnamed online retailer who sells everything. And I looked for, uh, I looked for sinkers and lead and fishing gear and found a whole lot of lead gear out there. And it's really cheap. That's the amazing thing that it's out there and it's cheap and they're not supposed to send it to you if you're in a place that has lead laws like New Hampshire's. But uh, I didn't try to order any, but it's just scary to think of how much is out there. Um, so I think Tiffany's back with us. I don't know. If yeah, I are. apologize. My internet kicked me out for some reason here, but yes, I am back, but I apologize for that. <laughs> I was just showing them the Loon Preservation Committee site. Um, go look around on there for Loon information loonsafe.org for all the information you need to make sure that we uh, work together to keep that lead out of that out of our, our lakes uh, in New Hampshire and elsewhere. Thank you, Merrick. That's awesome. Yes, thank you for showing that. And then on the cartooning side of it, I was going to flash my own site up there, MerrickBennett.com. And um, I did the Loon Tunes. Well, I'll show you the Loon Tunes. If you go down, there should be a link to, there they are. There's usually a link near the top to Loon Tunes. Um, and actually, what I'll show you, if you go down on there, you will find some links to, um, I actually have copies here, a bunch of little printables that you can use. So one of the projects I did through um, Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission last year for summer 2020, um, we did a series of live draws for campers and we created these little mini comics that actually show you uh, mostly wordlessly, mostly in pictures, um, some of the cartooning techniques I use when I draw the different scenes. So you can practice drawing diving loons, um, flying loons, uh, loons from different angles and get a sense of how they're built. Um, and that's just the first one, that's basic loons. Um, and we're up to about seven and we're doing some on lead and they all mention lead in some way. But there's how to draw different habitats, foods and things like that. So you can go on my site and find those. And these are printables. I do, as a cartoonist, I work in schools a lot. And these are actually single page printables that you can print out at home. And then I have a little video on my site that shows you how to do a top secret ninja fold up like that to turn that one piece of paper into a uh, eight page mini. And then you can learn how to do different Loon Tune techniques. And then I guarantee, um, next time you go out on the lake or next time you hear or see a loon, if you're lucky enough to, you'll notice something new about it, having drawn some of these very basic, simple cartoon style um, images. And you might also notice something different about the lakes or, or, or the other habitat around you um, and the birds around you. For me, it started with loons last year and uh, I kept going all winter. So I'm doing a series of these little books about all the birds that I uh, encounter and that catch my attention and that um, have little secrets to tell us. So, so this has been a really fun project and it's really wonderful to get to hear your presentation, Tiffany, tonight and draw with you and sort of toss some ideas around and see what we create. It's been fantastic, Merrick, and I, I love your drawings, and I love how much you're able to capture about um, loon biology um, and their environment uh, through your cartoons. I think it's just absolutely fantastic. It's been so much fun. 
Oh, thank you. Well, I think what I'm going to do after this is I'm going to take all the pages we've drawn together. And one way or another, I'm going to go in, because I'm a cartoonist, this is what I do. I'm going to go in with ink and ink them so they could be printouts or coloring pages. I'll make them look really nice and readable, clean them up a little, and then I'll post them. Um, and that's actually how I support a lot of my work. Um, on my site, you'll see right at the top, you'll see uh, my Patreon there. And if you want to join that, you can see the uh, black and white finished versions of the pencil drawings we started together there. Um, and I look forward to taking a look at that, Merrick. That's awesome. I can't wait. And yeah, and I'll toss it out to all of you as you're drawing along at home. I would love to see the pages that you're drawing too um, and see what direction you took your Looney Tunes in. So feel free to get in touch with um, with us on our websites, our various websites, or through the uh, emails that we're putting into the chat. Yeah, and thanks to Leanne for hosting this. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, both. Leanne. Yeah, yeah, that was really fun. That was a neat way to share information. I enjoyed that. So maybe we can do it again some other time yeah. on another topic. So. I don't know if people did draw along, if you wanna like share your drawings, <laughs> if people are into that. I always love to see what people came up with. Yeah. And like I said, we, we'd love to, if you wanna send them afterwards, feel free to clean them up and finish Ooh, them. Oh, nice. nice. <laughs> I like how cool. I like that neck, Elle. Oh, nice, nice. fabulous. <laughs> Go oh, a little check on the back. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> I love how much um, character comes through with when you simplify the, the artwork down, this character comes through. And we can stay on for a few minutes if folks have any questions, if anyone has any questions. Oh, cool. Fabulous. <laughs> so cool. Um, if, if folks have questions for Tiffany or Merrick, um, feel free to unmute yourself. We're a small group tonight, so um, we'll hang out for a few minutes. This is actually the uh, the perfect size group if we get together in person sometime. Um, this is a great size group to sit around a big table and draw together with. Um, and then we can put all our pages together on a, bo a bulletin board or something. And it's just, we can really assemble a whole lake full of critters. <laughs> so we'll have to try that sometime once we're all out and about. <laughs> So I have a couple questions. I mean, they're a little bit more basic loon 101 stuff that I don't know. Yeah, um, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> but where do the Squam loons winter? Um, on what part of the coast? Yeah, so most of our New Hampshire loons go right off the New England coast, basically anywhere from Rhode Island uh, up to Maine. And that actually used to be our standard answer. However, a couple of years ago, we had one of our squam loons turn up on the southern tip of New Jersey, way down in Cape May, New Jersey. And it was actually really cool because, um, you know, we have very limited data on where the loons go in winter because it's not, you know, they get out there in the ocean and, you know, got loons from Canada out there and other such places. And, you know, to be able to see one of our banded loons from New Hampshire or squam out there on the ocean, it's, you know, it's kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. And sadly, many of the loons that we have documented from the ocean, not all of them, but many of them have turned up dead, unfortunately. And, but, and most of them are from right along the New England coast. But as I say, it's a small sample size. And so it just goes to show how much we have to learn about these loons yet, how much we don't know, um, which is, it's, it's really, it's amazing how much we don't know about the loons. Um, and when we found that squam loon down on Cape May, New Jersey, that was like, wow. Um, that's our farthest south documented New Hampshire loon so far. Um, and who knows, maybe this winter one will turn up even further south. But it, it seems like the bulk of our loons are right, right off the New England coast yeah. from Rhode Island up to Maine. But some will go further. And um, it'll be fascinating as we, as we learn more on that. But if you do, if you go down to Florida in the winter, you see loons down there, those are actually the Midwestern loons. So Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, those loons go down to the Gulf of Mexico, east coast of Florida. Our New Hampshire loons have it easy and are basically right off the New England coast. Basically, the farther down the east coast you go, the further west you're going across the loons breeding range. I love that you think 
sitting in the water off the Rhode Island coast all winter have it has it easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least flying there is easy compared with uh, <laughs> compared with flying to Florida. But yeah, it'll they'll certainly encounter some harsh weather um, while they're sitting out there. <laughs> and that's another thing. If you get into drawing loons on the ocean, you realize oh, the, the markings that we were drawing tonight are their breeding season markings, and they're actually they molt. They and do. they change their markings entirely. Yep, they look like a completely different bird, practically, in the, uh, in the, in the winter. And then here's something for your cartooning. This would make for a fun cartoon. Uh, there's somebody up in um, Nova Scotia who sends us photographs of loons um, out on the ocean in the winter. This person has sent us amazing photographs of loons with lobsters. I mean, can you imagine a loon with a lobster? And apparently, much to everyone's horror, they snap the claws off. Like, oh, oh my God. God. you're missing the best part there. Um, but snap off the claws and then they eat the lobsters. But I always think, boy, those loons are eating better than I am during the winter. Um, but, you know, obviously they still eat a lot of fish. Um, the menhaden, and there's been some problems with the menhaden population, which is concerning because that's a real staple forage food for the loons in the winter. But Merrick, I would love to see a cartoon of sometime with you with a loon with a big lobster. <laughs> Let's let's work on that. Stay tuned that on the website, great. folks. That would be fabulous. <laughs> well, you're you're reminding me. We were walking down by the river near here. I'm on the Kentuckook River here, and we were walking along the river with my my niece and my nephew, and we were talking about erosion and noticing, you know, that how the rains had fallen and there was the water was kind of turbid, and um, and and we. And we were talking about how things flow down to the ocean, right? And my nephew said, but yeah, but does anything ever come back from the ocean to here, inland? And we thought for a minute, and then we realized like, oh, well, loons are an example of that. Like they're exactly. part of that churn. They're eating lobster and then they come back up here. They're like, there's huge cycles exactly. that we don't even think of or see happening, but exactly. are happening. Yeah, yeah. And it's so cool to think of loons being able to, you know, make that transition between freshwater and saltwater. And loons actually have these salt glands that are basically right here um, by their bills, and it filters out the um, it filters out the salts from their, you know, from their blood and from their system. And you'll actually see like little trickles of salt coming from well, on birds it's called nares, but it's basically like the nostrils. Uh, you'll see salt trickling down um, that's being so filtered out by that salt gland. And it's just it's so cool to think about the the two worlds that the loons live in. And of course the chicks, once the chicks have migrated from Swam Lake or other lakes in New Hampshire to the ocean for the winter, they actually spend those first couple of years out there. I mentioned loons don't mature till they're three years old. And so there's no point in them coming back to these freshwater lakes because they come here to nest and raise young. They're not mature yet. So they just spend those first couple of years out there on the ocean hanging out, eating lobster. <laughs> so they're saltwater birds through their whole childhood. They are, yep, 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 or pretty much through their teenage years. Of course, tiny, tiny, they're here on the freshwater lakes, but their their teenage years are basically spent saltwater birds. It's believed yeah. loons probably did evolve on the ocean. Um, and then as the glaciers receded and these freshwater lakes formed, loons figured out that these are great places to raise their young. Um, but they're, they're, probably, they're probably originally ocean going birds. This would make, we should do a, um, one of the minis just about the migration cycle. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Drawing that'd be awesome. Lakes. Yeah. I'm right, just well, Thank you again, Merrick and Tiffany. And if folks have other questions that pop up, feel free to email um, one of us, reach out. We'll pass the question along to the right person. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you all again soon at an upcoming program um, and maybe even out on the lake. It's been beautiful. So maybe not tomorrow. Tomorrow's <laughs> looking a little rainy, but in a few days, come see us on the lake. Have a great night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks for attending. And thanks, Thank Leanne. You. You're so Thanks. welcome. Good to draw.